Okay, so this is the flow we're trying to, to implement for the uh, login and logout uh, based information uh, actions in the, based on cookies. So basically from the browser, when the user sends some uh, credentials, uh, username and password, uh, we are issuing a special API call. We may call it uh, API login or login or something. And the server will, will check it and validate it and create uh, some object in the session storage uh, with some information about the user, like username, other information, email, and so on. Not the password, of course, it's not be stored here. Uh, but the server will check uh, whether the credentials are okay, and if they're okay, it will store some information on the server about the user itself. And it will return a cookie just with the session ID to the browser. So the browser only receives uh, the session ID and not the other data. And uh, on any other call, automatically the browser will attach the cookie that it received from the same server, so it will attach the same session ID. So the server will try and retrieve the data associated with this ID if it's still valid and it's still stored. And if it's wrong, of course, it generates a, a, an error. Okay, so you have received a session ID, I unlock, let's say, this data, and I can use this data in processing the response, uh, and then I, re I return the response and so on. Okay, so this is the mechanism, basic mechanism by the, which the server, the key point is that in the second API call, the server knows uh, which was the user that was authenticated in the previous call. Uh, this was session R4. So that from this point uh, to that point, uh, I would not normally remember anything, but I go that way through the browser to be able to remember. That's the purpose of, of cookies, okay? Uh, we will always use HTTP-only cookies. Uh, in development mode, we are not using secure cookie, cookies that, that should be the normal uh, basic uh, say security. If anybody reads uh, a session ID, it can call other APIs uh, by pretending to be another user. Okay, so the session ID says this communication here. The session ID that doesn't carry any information by itself, but if I can replicate an existing ID, I can replicate that user session until it's valid, until it expires. So that's why uh, we should always send cookies through HTTPS in, 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 on an encrypted channel. Of course, in development mode, we are not going to set up certificates and so on, so we will run with simple, uh, say, unauthenticated uh, cookies, but in production, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important to do that. Okay, so in practice, uh, the login uh, operation, as we said, uh, starts with the user that fills a form in the client. It's a normal form. It's validated normally, and it will lead to a post API saying, okay, I want to log in. So the browser can only col collect, collect data from the user and send to the server. The server checks uh, the credentials and tells me yes or no. These username and password match or they don't. And of course, uh, by being careful about uh, not exposing data about the password uh, compared and so on. And so the server tells me these credentials are valid or they are not valid. And so the client application should, uh, let's say, set the context to the right user or not. At the same time, the server will generate a session ID and will start storing information about the current user so that on every next call, the server already know, knows who is the user. And so I don't need to tell the server who I am anymore because I already told it once at login time. So also the client cannot, do, cannot play any tricks. I log in with a one name and the next API call, I give you a parameter with a different name. Okay, imagine the question and answer that we had before. The client should not give the 
email of the person who wrote the answer. Uh, because uh, the server should already know who is the logged in user, and so will associate, uh, like, with our, well, like we do with the score, like we do with the date. The server already knows what date is today, and the, 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 that, that initial score should be zero. And at this point, the server should already know who is the currently logged in user. And so it should never, neither receive nor trust any information about the client telling the server, I'm this user. There's only one point in which the client is telling the, the server who is the user, is at, at login time. After that, the server already knows, and the server should already trust its own information. Okay? Uh, if it does that, it will store this information into the session storage on the server side, and the cookie is generated. From the client point of view, it's a normal form. It's a normal login form that calls some uh, login callback, and uh, this callback could be successful or not, depending. So most of the work is done on the server side for managing the, the cookies, the security, the validation, and so on. And for doing that, we are using uh, one library, which is called, uh, was very common, which is called Passport. And Passport is a say, common library, JavaScript library, for implementing different types of authentication. Uh, they call them uh, strategies. So they have uh, five, more than 500 different uh, strategies uh, so mechanism of choices for authentication. You can use Microsoft, you can use GitHub, you can use uh, basic HTTP, you can use uh, open authentication, mm, any type of, uh, say, authentication mechanism uh, is supported, basically. And there are some commonalities between them. So the passport library gives you some basic uh, some function calls so that are uh, common to all of these methods, and of course, some of them will have uh, something uh, more specific. Okay, so it's a general framework for authentication, and uh, once we choose how to authenticate that, uh, we have the specific, uh, you know, documentation how to how to configure that. Um, so it's a useful library. It doesn't require you to do all the crypto stuff yourself or session management yourself, and so on. Uh, on the back side is that uh, is one of the worst documented libraries that I've ever found. So if you try to understand something from this documentation, good luck. Huh? And uh, because it takes for granted that you already know how it works, uh, and so it only gives you the detail, but it will fails uh, to give you the context. Huh? So that's, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> in which uh, basically the work here is trial and error or copying something that it works. Uh, that is something that we really hate, but uh, uh, let's, say, let's leave with that. Um, so uh, I will try to explain or describe how to work uh, with this library basically by say describing a step-by-step -step tutorial and having a look at the at portion of, of, of running code, uh, which is in the, in our example, on the, well, on the with authentication project, uh, client and server. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry we cannot uh, reason a lot about the mechanism, the, the concepts, because okay, it's against uh, uh, the way this, uh, this library is organized. So let's take it as a uh, how-to, let's say, uh, procedure. So. Uh, in general, in password, we should, uh, first of all, choose which strategy we want to adopt. So which of these uh, we want to adopt. Uh, and we will go, basically, with the, uh, the basic authentication, which is called uh, local username and password, which is the simplest one. It's one of the many, but uh, it's the simplest one to implement because it doesn't require any extra infrastructure. So we choose that. Uh, and we uh, customize uh, this strategy by giving the information it needs to work. For example, okay, uh, username and password, but the, where are usernames stored? Uh, where, how is the password encrypted? We need to give this kind of information. And this also will require us some 
additional middleware to install in Express, okay? We are talking about the server side to be able to manage that. And, uh, uh, and then decide uh, what is the, you know, in my picture some slides ago, I said, uh, okay, the username plus some user information. Okay, which is this information? We must decide the structure of an object uh, that will represent everything we need to know about a user in the server. So first step, choosing the strategy. Uh, as you mentioned, we uh, decide to use the local strategy that stores uh, username and password locally to the server. Okay? Support authentication with username and password. So this means that we need to install the passport library plus the passport local strategy to different packages from NPM. And uh, as you see from the code here, um, we import passport and we configure passport to use a local strategy. This is how we are saying, telling password which, are, which is our strategy. We create an object of type local strategy and we are giving it to passport. Uh, and this local strategy basically depends on a callback function that we call, uh, we say, it's verify, that gets the username and the password to, to verify, to check. Okay, so we create a local strategy. The argument of the local strategy is a callback that is called with a username and a password. When passport, when the passport library knows that it needs to check the login of a user, it will call this verify function. We are not calling it, okay? We are just configuring into the passport library saying, okay, when you need to check a login, call this function. And we'll call it with a username and a password. We'll see later, how, later on how to call it, okay? How to make it, have it called. We are not calling it explicitly. And uh, what is this function doing? It will check, it needs to check the password and the username and after checking, it will call a callback function, which is called callback, okay? This callback function, so this uh, uh, verify, doesn't return anything, is not expected to return a value, is expected to call the callback function. And uh, uh, the callback is, not the verify function, but the callback itself as some strange parameters can be called in four different ways. Okay, so I have a verify function that will basically do a query in the database. Okay, do you have a user with this username and this password? Yes or not? Depending on the result of this, I should call the callback with four different methods four different, uh, say, set of parameters. First parameter is null, or first parameter is an error object. And uh, um, the first parameter basically is the error. If it's null, we don't have any specific error. We may have an, a user object or false. So. Null user is the good case. The user was valid, the password was valid, so I will build a user object with all the properties that I need, and I call callback null user object. This stores the user object into password, say, okay, now I know that this user is logged in. Second option, the password is wrong, or the username doesn't exist, or they don't match. So I call the callback with null false. Not undefined, but false. And this means that uh, I checked the login and it was wrong, so the login is not successful, the user is not logged in. There's no user logged in. I'm telling passport, these credentials are not valid. If I want, I can also explain why. 
So I can provide a third parameter with a message field, an object with a message field that contains an error message, an explanation. Why? Okay. So there are two variants. Null, username, null, false. Or something went wrong, so I couldn't check the credentials. Maybe the database is down, there's some error and so on, or the application level. So in that case, uh, I will return an error object uh, instead of a null object as a first parameter. So it's different uh, if we, I couldn't check the credentials or I check them and they are not valid. Because those are two normal cases. They are part of the login flow. Login goes through or it doesn't. In this case, we have an error of some, of some kind that needs to be managed by checking the exception and so on. Okay, so we have these four ways of exiting from the verify function. So I'm checking the user. Maybe we have this get user function on the database level. If it returns no user, then I will say false, incorrect user. Otherwise, the user is not null, I can return it, the user object, okay? So this is just something that okay, calls a callback inside a callback that we have inside a local strategy that we are uh, configuring inside Passport. Not get lost. Of course, the check user, get user uh, method should check the database. So the get user will receive a username, a password, and will say they are correct or not by checking the database. But we don't want to store any password in clear into the database. So every time we need to store a password, we need to encrypt it in some way so that we can take a password in clear, re-encrypt it, and check the encrypted version with the, previous, with the one that is stored in the database. But from what we have in the database, we can never go back uh, uh, to, to, the clear, to the clear text. Uh. So for example, here in the server, uh, if you open the SQLite file, you see that the passwords are where is the password uh, in the user table. The passwords are something like that, something meaningless, just a number. Okay, so uh, I will. The user gives you a password in clear. One, two, three, four, five. What you do is to encrypt this password, will give you a hash, and you compare the hashes with what you have in the, in the database. Okay? And when a new user is created, you need to store into the database uh, the hash, uh, the crypto, crypto hash of the password that the user provided you when, when registering. Okay, so the password in clear are, has a very short life. Just given by the client to the server and immediately encrypted and forgotten, never stored anywhere, anywhere. So this requires the knowledge of some functions to do this hashing and de and encrypting and so on. Um, in particular, we can use this function um, as script, which is in the uh, in the module which is called crypto. Now, crypto is already installed into Node.js and contains uh, this uh, S script secure crypt uh, um, function that we can use. Uh, practically, uh, we have two basic functionalities. One is uh, encrypting a password. So you take a password in clear a salt, a length, and a function with the result. It's asynchronous, okay? It's not based on, uh, it's a callback function that is called with the hash password. 
the password is in clear, and uh, it will, the callback will receive uh, the uh, hashed password. What is salt? Salt is another random number that uh, potentially should be dif different every time. Why? Why? Uh, if imagine that we have three users that by chance uh, use the same password. Your password is admin, your password is admin too. If I look at the database, I'm not able to see which is your password, but I will see that the two users have the same hash because they were using the same um, password. To avoid this problem of recognizing users with the same password, we encrypt this password differently. So we generate a random string, this salt, and in the encryption function, we concatenate your admin password with the salt, which every time is different. And so even if you have the same password, I am concatenating them with different salts, and the, the final hash will be different. Of course, uh, if we do that, when we check for the password, we, f we, we, we must again do the same trick, take the real password from the login form, attach the same salt, uh, and check the password. Uh, so that's why we need to store also the salt. So a random salt and an encrypted uh, value that depends on the user password and the current salt. These are normally a good enough protection so that you cannot go back from the hash password to the password itself uh, and you can neither, uh, mm, uh, say, find whether two passwords are the same or not. Hmm? And so you use this function both when you create a new user and when you validate a new user. And by the way, it's, uh, um, there's also a function that compares uh, a hash password uh, with a stored password. So the password that is stored in the database and the password that is given, um, the, the, is computed by the, by the crypto module. Uh, it's not just an equal, uh, because from the you know, uh, people working in security are really paranoid by, for a reason. Um, the time that you need to discover that the two passwords are the same or not can be used by an attacker to understand something about the password themselves. So that's why we have this uh, timing safe equal so that it's guaranteed that it will take always the same time, whether it's good or not. Uh, so that the attacker could not, uh, let's say, guess from the response time whether it's more or less close to guessing a password. Don't ask me more because I'm not a security expert. You have a question? Yes, yes. Uh, so even if the usernames are different, uh, you are, you are not encrypting the username here. So this, uh, encrypt, uh, this uh, hash uh, code is only from, the pa from the, your password. The user will check, uh, I'm providing the username and the password in clear. From the password in clear, you compute the hash and you, comp and you compare them. Okay, so the uh, username is not involved in the computation of the hash. Yes. Because if, if everybody could steal this database for some reason, I can never ensure that the database will be safely stored for the rest of my life. If uh, he steals this, uh, he could uh, understand that there are, there are a group of users. Uh, so by, uh, in a normal work of the application, it doesn't matter. But we are protecting against the exfiltration of this data. If this data comes out, we don't want to give any help to the attacker about learning something about my users. So that's, uh, the, the, the sole thing is a protection against discovering that different users uh, have the same password if the database is stolen. That's on the only point. Hmm? Yes?
Yes? Yeah, you can you can either serialize as a string or or store that in, in binary. It should not contain it, it should not contain UTF code or other code because it's just a yes, it's a binary buffer, yeah. and you serialize that in X. We are not decoding that in UTF. It's just a binary. It's not a UTF string anyway. We are taking the bytes one by one and converting them in hexadecimal. We are never parsing that, that data. No, because, no, because I'm doing, I'm, we, we see the code. I'm doing the conversion in JavaScript, not in SQLite. Let's see the code. Uh, this, uh, so this is an example of uh, the get user method. Remember, the verify function was calling get user to say, okay, let's check with the database. So get user receives a clear text user and a clear text password. In this case, we are, what we are doing here, we are doing a get for getting the row of the user table from this username. Uh, and of course, if there is no user with the username, we are done. There's no user. If there is some user, I extract the ID and the username, of course, and uh, the salt. I need the salt enabled to re encrypt the clear text password into the new hash. With the salt, I call the crypt function password. In clear, this is the only time I'm using it. The salt that comes from the database, and okay, this is the trick for the asynchronous calling because it doesn't uh, return a promise. Uh, this callback is called by the crypt function with the hash password. And this hash password is compared to the Password from the database, you see that we are encoding them um, in X. From the, we are decoding. So this was a, a string. We are in X. We are creating a binary buffer from the string because timing safe equal requires binary buffers. This is a binary buffer, it's not a string. This was a string from the database. We are uh, encoding the string in binary. So encoding or decoding, uh, decoding. And so this is a binary buffer. This is another binary buffer, and they com we are comparing with that. See, there's one choice. The other choice could be to store the binary data as blobs in SQLite, but it would become also more difficult for us to see and to debug. Okay. Yes. It's not UTF. There's no UTF symbol. Because the buffer doesn't contain text, it contains binary data. That doesn't need the. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you could store it as a blob, yes, if you want. I, I store, we store that in Excel just to make it more readable and easy to, to manage, basically. When you export, import, and so on. But you can, you, it's a choice. As long as internally they are working with buffers, with binary buffers, and you can store them, just a choice. You can encode or decode. Uh, we are encoding them in Excel before storing and then rebuilding the binary when we, when we check or the other way around. 
just a, a choice, how, we, how you store them into SQLite. Uh, but in no, in no case, uh, I will see an encoding or decoding from UTF. It's just uh, X strings or binary buffers. Okay. Um, this for the initial check. Remember, database is doing this crypto work and is telling me, okay, the user is okay, resolve with the user, or we have no user. Resolve false or undefined or whatever. And this will, information will go back to the verify function, okay? That will validate the login or not. Now, this information that the login has been validated must go into the session. So we need to instruct uh, Express to handle a session. By default, Express, Express doesn't generate session cookies. We need to add an extra middleware to Express, the yes, to manage sessions, that's easy. We import the session middleware. It's a normal Express middleware. And we say that uh, we want to use, so we register the middleware in the app. So we are doing two, two steps here. One is telling Express to use sessions. And the other is telling Passport to store authentication information in the session. Okay, these are two steps. One, express, please use cookies. And the other, password, okay, store the, session informa store the authentication information in the session. Otherwise, uh, okay. Um, and by initializing a session, we usually should provide a, a secret phrase that is used to encrypt the session ID. Remember the session ID should be a random encrypted number or a string, and this string is encrypted with a, with a salt that is taken from this random string. So you can write whatever you want. Uh, if you write something different from the others, uh, nobody will be able to guess uh, uh, your session IDs because they will be generated started from this so-called secret. Okay? Um, if you, I, I see that uh, sometimes uh, at the exams when two people use it, are using the same secret because they just use the code from the, from the labs, uh, uh, it happens that a session, and I test in the, the examining sequence, I see that the next user will find a session which is already authenticated no? because the cookie is valid uh, because it's being uh, uh, signed by the wrong, uh, by the wrong, by, by another secret, by another server that had the same secret. So, if you want to invalidate any session, you just have to change this secret. So, but the idea is uh, change it through anything you want, different from from the others. Okay, and it's used uh, as a as a seed for for uh, for encryption. Uh, right now, the session storage that we're using uh, by default is just a memory session. So basically, Node is storing in memory the information about the current sessions. Of course, it's not scalable. If we have thousands of sessions, we are increasing the memory, or uh, it can, we cannot replicate uh, the, the server for scalability reasons. Uh, or if you restart the server, the sessions are lost. Okay. So the real deal will be storing session data into the database, into an extra table in the database. We are not going this extra step, okay? But this is just for um, express sessions. Um, okay, these are just the, the explanation of the, um, of the options in, uh, in the express session middleware. Now, we have uh, uh, user information from login. Right now, the verify function is only called a login, right? And it will check whether the user is valid or not. And this information is stored in the session. So every time, for every next API call, automatically, this session is available. The information that we store in the session is available. In the 
session storage. The, the username that we, the user object that we store there is there, okay? Um, we have two methods uh, that are called serialize and deserialize that are able to, uh, that are needed uh, to retrieve or store information from the session the user information. So whenever we need to um, extract information about the user, we call deserialize, so it takes the string from the session and it builds a, a user object. And serialize is the other way around. We pass an object, it will be serialized and stored into the session. Uh, the serializer, of course, should be called only when some information about the user is going to change. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's redundant. So it's a way of extracting from the session storage uh, information about the user so that it can be used by the, by the, um, uh, by the application code, by, by our application code. Uh, in particular, serializer uh, saves uh, in the session some information about the user. You see the user received here. And we can, uh, we can call a callback uh, again with the same convention. The first parameter is an error, null is if it's OK, and then the object uh, representing the user data. And this will store basically this information into some private variable of passport inside the session. So request is a request. The request contains the cookie. Request the session is the, uh, is the uh, session information related to that cookie. Request the session is implemented by the session middleware. Okay, so it unlocks data stored in the session. One uh, property of this session data is called passport. Part, passport is a property that stores information that where, 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 where passport is storing its own information. So we cannot read this information directly, but we can serialize or deserialize it for extracting from that because it stores uh, objects of its own sort. So. And uh, the deserialize uh, is for retrieving the same information from the passport session property whenever we need it. Uh, so actually, this is a method that is used to extract from the session the information in the form of an object that can be passed to the, to the, to the user. And uh, the deserialized user, is a fu these functions are called automatically by, by password in the right moments, right? When they need to, to save information before, let's say, returning or to retrieve information when they start a new callback. They are in the middleware. Uh, the interesting part for us is the la this last sentence. Uh, in every authenticated request, uh, we have an object called request.user. This is what, what password is doing for us. After login, we store in the session all these mechanisms, serialize, deserialize. But after login, every time we call an API, in that API request object, passport, passport is storing a user property. We have request.body, OK. We have request.parameters, OK. Yeah, and in addition, we have request.user, which is the deserialized version of the current user, the object that we return from the database. It did a long trip because from the database it was stored in the session and it serialized and then it serialized again and so on. Never mind. At the end, we have a request.user that contains all the information about the user that is currently logged in in this current session. And this is the data that we can use. We can use it if we define all the intermediate functions, verify, serialize, and deserialize, and so on. So it's a long way to configure, but then once it's configured, it's easy. So this is the, config what the configuration phase. Verify, deserialize, deserialize, object structure, and so on. Now, the routes. 
And we need to have an API for logging in. And uh, we can create a post API with a login, for example, URL, with a middleware that is called Authenticate. Local is the name of, of the strategy, the strategy that we configured before. So the middleware means that the request is processed before by the verify function, and then it may either fail with the error message that it provided, or succeed, and so the, call, the final callback is only called if the authentication is successful. Otherwise, it's blocked. And so if we are here, then request.user will be the current user. So everything is happening in the middleware, hidden to us, in the configured middleware. If every check is okay, so this may authenticate, will uh, call verify, and the verify will call the database, will do all the crypt stuff, and will serialize and serialize the information in the session, this serialize it and store it into user. Okay, that's, where, that's our point. Now we have request.user. And we can do whatever we want, for example, and return it uh, to the caller. But this is just a route. What do, you, what do I want to log in to return? Just more false or the username or all the information about the user is my choice. Okay, so all the actions that need to be done at login time are managed by authenticate middleware. Uh, and now we are back in React and we are storing this information. Uh, we are just a normal API call that comes back with the user information, normally I will put that into a context. Um, at login, I can return some information about the user. Or I could also provide an extra API to get information about the user, maybe in a second time, if I don't want to rely only on the context. So maybe uh, something like get user info or uh, an API that will call the server and the server will just return request.user. That's it, the object, whenever you need it, even after login. Huh? Um, okay, so if the login is wrong, we are, we are done, no, nothing happens. If the login is good, then we set up a cookie, a session, and a user object that is available on every next call. So the idea is that uh, all the, the next APIs, we want to protect them. We want to execute the next APIs only if uh, a login was successful in, this, in the current section. Uh, protecting uh, the routes uh, is also implemented by a simple uh, middleware sorry, which is this one, request does is authenticated. So it's a middleware that we can put, uh, it's, uh, oh, sorry, is authenticated is not, uh, it's, a, it's, a, sorry, it's a Boolean function. At the beginning of the route, we can check if it's authenticated, but we can also write that as a middleware that check is authenticated like this one, for example. We define a middleware. In this case, we are applying it only to this call. It's logged in, and this middleware is just checking is authenticated. Request does authenticated. Again, this is a property that has been injected into the request by passport. We already did app.use passport, so passport is already happening. No, it's already being called. So we define a simple middleware like this, and we specify this middleware on every API that we want to protect. That's it. Or maybe we do an app.use of this middleware, and so all the APIs from this point on will be protected. So we can have the first block of APIs that are public, and then app.use is logged in, and all the other APIs below that are automatically protected. This is what happens on the server side. The problem is that uh, we have our friend uh, course uh, that is already uh, again getting in the way. 
remember that we have to configure course to let uh, the server respond, or basically the client make requests to the server. Um, we have uh, to no, uh, have give more information in order to, for course to be able to let the cookies uh, go through. Okay, otherwise you will blo block uh, uh, the cookies themselves. So on the server side, we, we should provide some course options by saying, okay, accept security credentials from this origin. And the origin will be the URL of the React application. So we cannot do that for every origin. You can, the credential true cannot be set uh, on by, for, by default for everybody. So we must do, have this extra configuration on the server and also on the fetch, when we call the API, we should also have an extra option called credentials. So we remember the fetch, usually we have the options object only when doing the post or a put because we need to provide extra data and not for the get. Right now, if we want to, if we want to use the sessions, we should add this attribute, this property for every fetch. Uh, all of them, basically, okay? So, uh, it's some extra modifications that are done to enable this uh, session to go through. Uh, logout is easy, again, because we have a method, uh, again, uh, in injected by passport on the request called logout. So if you call request.logout, it will destroy the user information. And so the session will not be authenticated anymore. So the big effort is setting up everything. And then we have these very, very simple methods. Request.logout, request.is authenticated, request.user that contains all the user information, and of course the login was that uh, the authenticate middleware just at login time. It's very easy to forget about something, and so it may not work at the first try, because there are a lot of levels at which you need to configure stuff uh, from the session to the course uh, to the passport and the strategy and the origin of the server and so on. Um, So, if we just walk through the code for this application, which is working, okay, at least yesterday evening it was working, we, have, we see that we have a login, but it's just a bit different from the one that we had before because it took from, we did it together with Luigi, but uh, the, the general idea is the same. We have this uh, login function that we didn't have before. So, if you go there, for example, to the tables, you don't see any action buttons. Do you see any action buttons? Because we are not logged in. So they are not rendered. And uh, if we go to the component, for example, rendering the answers component here. Okay, so let's look at the code. Source, component, answers. You have an answer table that you see that we have a property which is called logged in. And this logged in property is used to decide whether to render the actions or not. Okay, so we are using the, the information the logged in information, the answer row, for example, to decide whether to render the action buttons or not. In this case, this logged in property is coming from above, from up. We have a state in logged in, a state, sorry, logged in in up, 
that remembers either uh, is a good login was made or not. This is a normal state. It's a Boolean false and true state. Plus, we have another state called user that will send, uh, will remember the user information. So at login time, what do we do? At login time, we render a login form. A login form is a normal form, username and password. We see it here. A very normal form. And uh, when everything, when the user submits, uh, it will call the login callback. So login callback in app, what does it do? Uh, and the login, this one. It gets the credential, username and password, and calls an API. If this API returns, then it's said that the, the user is logged in and set the current user to the result of this API call. Otherwise, it faces, so it will show an error message. What does the login API do? The login API will, here, call a, uh, do a post on API sessions. The idea is uh, we, the server may have many sessions, so we are post, so we are creating a new session. Am I giving the credentials in the body of this request? Just notice that we have also credential include as in any that need to be added to all the API calls. This concludes the client side of the login. So if this uh, fetch is OK, then we return the user from the response. Otherwise, we return uh, an error. We throw an error. Okay? So this is the client side. It's normal. I like sending any other form. The difference in the, is in the server side. So let's go to the server. In the server, you see that uh, we have a passport imported. We have a passport local imported and express session. With these three new packages that we mentioned before. And then we are configuring them. So we have the course options to be able to accept the credentials. If you forget about this, uh, the cookies will not go through. We are setting up passport, and so we are setting the, basically creating the strategy, defining the verify function, and defining serialized and deserialized functions. In this case, both functions are not doing anything, actually. They are just extracting the object from the, the, the session and then storing it back to the session. They could do something more if we want to have a, maybe only a subset of the fields. Uh, or, but right now we are just, they are needed because they are called, they can do some work. In this case, we don't need to do any special work. So we are, the configuration is local strategy, verify, serialize, deserialize. Then we have the, is logged in middleware to protect the routes that simply calls is authenticated. Finally, we have the configuration of the application, so enabling sessions and uh, telling passport to use the session. This is all the configuration that you saw in the previous slides, all together, okay? This block of, li of lines. <clears throat> then, login. It will be a post to sessions. Yeah. So this is the login API. It will receive, so API sessions, and we have a middleware, the middleware starts here and ends there. Uh, and uh, there, so sorry. Here. And what it does is to call authenticate
and uh, with a uh, authentically local with the middle uh, with a callback function and the convention is always the same the first parameter can be an error and if it's not an error it's, it's a null and, in, and the real information is in the second authenticate we know it calls verify and verify will do the check on the database and uh, according to whether the user if I have an error I go forward if I don't have the user I can send some error message. And finally, I can call login, request.login, that uh, uh, initiates the login session for stores uh, the information in the session for the first time. OK. So this is the authenticated method that basically returns uh, if everything is okay, this is the key point, uh, if everything is okay, it returns to the user, to the browser, a user object. The user object that the database, uh, that was extracted by the verify function. Okay, verify was here. Uh, ah, was at the very beginning. Local strategy, verify get user and what we return here as a user goes to the login and get user is actually the code that we saw in the slides uh, where uh, we are comparing and uh, and if, if the passwords match uh, they resolve the user uh, for creating new users uh, we don't have any registration for registering new users here okay it's not implemented. And uh, in the exam, we are not asking you to implement a registration. So you don't need to do any registration. Usually, we, you can put uh, the, um, the users by hand into the database. Well, if you want, you can implement it, but uh, it's not needed. And so probably you will, you will generate, uh, there's a link here, uh, to gen you know, well, at this link, you can generate the hashes by hand uh, and storing them in the database, okay? If you don't want to implement a registration function that, are, that they are not required and they will not be tested at the exam. So we assume that we, you provide us in the readme some usernames and passwords that are already being um, stored in the database. So that's the login. And... Uh, uh, the other API calls are just protected by is logged, is logged in, is logged in. You see that uh, this, this post uh, is, is logged in. So before the validation, if the user is not logged in, I will get an error. And so for the others, we decide which ones uh, are. Uh, protected. In this case, in this implementation, it's only protected the post uh, of a vote, so vote up, uh, <coughs> and, uh, um, uh, and you, uh, modifying an answer and adding a new answer. And uh, but then the, the, the rest of the implementation is the same. There's one detail that is not uh, shown in this implementation, is that actually the email field should not be provided. Now we have it here because it's already in the API, already in the implementation. But normally in a real application, I will not give you the email because the email is already in request.user.email. And that has been validated cryptographically. This is just a data, some data field that is coming from the client. So instead of relying on an email sent on the request, the server should always use request.user.email or request.user.username and so on. So the server will always store information about the current user that has been validated. Unless, unless you want a user to be able to post something with the identity of a different user. It may be the case, okay, maybe an, an administrator can 
change some data also with a different email than its own. So in that case, you should provide this parameter, but it's only a special case. Normally, it's not the application that should tell the server the identity of the user, but the server already knows, and it's already there in request.user. Okay. Right now here, you don't see many usages of request.user. Uh, because the, um, the implementation is from before. So. But normally, we should get rid of the user information in all the API calls because the server already knows that. Finally, we have a get API sessions current. It's a get that tell me who is logged in currently. So that if the client needs in a, maybe in a component to know the, some information about the user, you can, only, you can just simply call this API which will return an error if the user is not authenticated or return the user object. It's just a commodity function, let's say, for, for returning the object to the client. And this transforms the, so I can write, uh, uh, in this database, the password should be test test. Okay, so it will tell me, you see, this button from log, log in became lo log out because uh, it now is checking the logged in local state. We are in React. Now everything is in, uh, is in apt. apt. And we see that the states of apt are logged in through user, we have the ID, the name, and the username, the email of the user. So after login, the successful action of the login form, we had this set state, set logged in true, set user with information that came from the API. And so with this information, the user interface has been changed. For example, you see that uh, in this question list, uh, we have some actions and some partial action on another because in this case, uh, this is my question, so I can edit or delete it. These are not my questions, so I cannot edit or delete them. And uh, this is my question, so I cannot upvote it, but I can vote other people's questions. So it's uh, inside the code, we have a comparison. We want to see it. We are again the client in the uh, answer component, uh, answer action. You see that we are comparing, for example, props.answers.useEmail, so the email field of this row with prop.user username. So the username of the currently logged in user. This props.user is coming from the app state user. And so we are customizing the interface by checking whether the user is logged in or not, and so showing or not, for example, the add button is being shown or not. And also individual items of the interface can be enabled or disabled or shown or hidden according to the user identity in this case. Maybe we have some more complex types of users, you normal user, uh, admin user, and so on, and so you will not need to enable but this is all normal React. It's managed with normal React states. Uh, maybe the user could be put in a context to make it more readily available. But from the client side point of view, you only need to implement the login and logout uh, functions. And remember, basically, in API, yes, this, uh, this modification, always to put credential include in all the API calls. That's a work, extra work that needs to be done on the client side. All the rest is just normal state. And the server needs that configuration, and once it's configured, it's uh, again uh, just uh, is logged in in the crucial points. And remember, request.user contains all the information that you need about the user. Uh, so it's a walkthrough or some application which is running, so you can, from this solution and also the solution of the next lab, 
that will be again on this topic, you can, you are authorized, since the topic of today, to still call for your own uh, project, for your own exam, okay? So this, uh, it's normal that this part uh, is re really a cut and paste from a work working solution to a new project, okay? Because uh, all the details need to be set up and uh, it's easy to, to, to forget something if you start from scratch from the slide. So you can start from this code if you want. Of course, from the client side, you can you know, integrate it in, uh, according to your, uh, your taste, uh, but on the server side, basically just implement these three functions, uh, login, logout, and uh, current session, so that you, you can use them. And this sort of concludes the course. So with the most boring topic of all the semester of the authentication, so, but it needs to be there, at least in the simplest form. And uh, remember the seminar next week uh, and the labs in the this and next week also. And of course, next week we we'll start uh, discussing online about the um, proposed project for the exam. Okay, so have a nice day. Bye-bye.